Hello everyone, welcome back to Deep Dive. This is episode number six, and today I'd like to talk about trills. So this week I've been thinking about um, why composers write trills in their score, and uh, what kinds are there, and of course how to play them, how to work on them, and um, for them to really shine um, within a piece. So let's get to it. So trills, by definition, it's really two adjacent notes that are oscillating um, quickly. So two adjacent notes that are... You use two fingers. I usually use one and a three because those are uh, easiest for me. But um, they really, uh, you should be able to play them quite equally in any two of your fingers. Uh, trills, uh, most simply, uh, exist to um, ornament a note. Just like little earrings on a person, it doesn't change the person, but maybe it elevates how they look or uh, gives them a little bit of um, shine. For example, in Bach's fifth suite um, in Alamand, in the very beginning, uh, you have this. I will play it without the ornament, without the the trill and see what it sounds like. current of the phrasing um, stays the same. It's just a little bit different and we get to hear the same phrase um, in a slightly different light. And Bach writes the repeat at the end of the section, so I actually get to play it twice. So in performance, I would play it one sort of a simplified version without the ornamentation or trill, and then second time I would um, play it with the trills. In certain places, uh, composers use trills not only to ornament a phrase or uh, a main line, but um, it is used to heighten the energy level or create drama. For example, um, at the end of the exposition of Beethoven's third piano concerto, we have this. It's a long trill, long way to go, so you start very soft. Also because it is an accompanimental figure to what's happening in the orchestra. I'll play it with the left hand. Until there, I play very softly and then it makes a turn. Everything changes with this E natural because... at the end and that's really the end of the the exposition and orchestra comes in um, very boisterously and then we are on to uh, the development so this is a an interesting turn because um, it this really could not exist without the trills this whole section these repeating In a way, I feel like trills are quite minimalist because you keep hearing the same notes ring over and over. When I think this kind of repetition is sort of like a, a, a pressure cooker. You know, it's not going anywhere. It should, it, when there's lots of changes, I feel like it's a much easier listen. But when you hear the same note over and over, like an alarm, it creates some kind of, um, pressure into the system, which re really needs to be released in this section. It's this um, dominant chord really wants to go here, but the trill is sort of preventing from that, um, that uh, cadence to happen. Only 
with the last notes of the left hand that um, the cadential moment um, occurs. And I think this, without this trill, that arrival could not happen because if I were to just stay on one note, it's a totally different feeling because of course, as soon as you hit, the note starts to dissipate. So composers really put the adjacent note next to it and we trill and work very hard to get it to that very dramatic crescendo in order to bring it home to E flat major only to change again with the development. Another example of a trill that um, really decides where uh, the direction of the phrase is going is in the second movement of the Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto. It's um, again in the background. It's something that shimmers far away. When it's at a softer dynamic and when things are very calm, sometimes I play it a little bit slower. So instead of not coiled so tightly, but a little bit loose, maybe slightly more and um, less attack on each note as well so I can round it a little bit more, round the sound. Maybe I do a little bit of even hand oscillating, so instead of moving just, just your finger, but sort of moving my entire... That somehow makes it a little bit um, more soothing to the edges of the sound. away and we notice this as the main force coil it so when it becomes a different character you have to change really the speed of the trill from this to maybe the crescendo there's a little crescendo involved which um, adds to the tension and when that happens, I feel like um, it's sort of like the rubber band that you've been going like this and then it, it just pops and you let go. So you have to really be ready because actually that's a very exciting thing to play and um, sometimes I have too much fun <laughs> and then this whole scale becomes much more difficult. Uh, but it's, it's an itch interesting change. Um, that even though it's written exactly the same um, for the entire time, you have to think about what role the trill plays within the phrase and really change the timbre or um, the quality of the sounds depending on what story you're telling um, with the trill. Trills play a very big role in Ravel's Piano Concerto in G. In the cadenza um, of the first movement, I think uh, the trills are the most important thing that drives the, this cadenza forward and makes it interesting. It's really seen everywhere throughout. And uh, play a little bit for you. before the trill. It's a totally different 
different texture, it's a different piece, really. Um, so why did Ravel write these trills? I think um, the, for me, it's, it creates a, a very special texture because um, he always trills the one... Um, everything is um, a minor second. So when you hear... Instead of a C major chord, you have the one, one note trilling with its upper neighbor. So, instead of, we have fragrant um, next door neighbor that is really seeped into a, otherwise a very pristine landscape. Instead of, we have this in there. overlapping of sound I think um, creates this very dreamy almost mystical feel to it um, borderline exotic um, whatever it is it really gives it that um, uh, different texture and feeling um, to this cadenza I really think of um, this cadenza as um, I picture these hummingbirds um, that seem to go from one area to another area and you really don't see them in between because they're so light and so quick and when I think of these trills, I think of um, you know the fluttering of the of their wings that because it's so delicate. You know there is that that change in. Um, where they are depending on where the melody takes me this is a very whimsical and um, very mysterious little bit that um, i practiced quite a bit before i played the ravel concerto so um, a very very unique use of the trills here another way i'd like to think of trills is um, by imagining something that's beginning to spin um, trills because um, it keeps returning to each other's pitch it's sort of this never-ending spinning motion in my mind um, so in Nocturne by Grieg we have this The trill part starts in the right there, but right before the trill, we have this. He writes da da pa da ta da, and then a little bit faster, and then the trill. So in my mind, um, he's simply signifying for the pianist to um, sort of nudge the spinning motion forward with the. So we can finally um, spin after um, this lead-in. So instead of thinking it in different um, rhythmic formats, sometimes when I see a trill, I think about what does the composer mean by writing this trill? Is it just um, starting to trill right there or is it um, a result of what's happening before? And I think um, in this section, it's, um, it's starting a couple of notes before that, and it's just the aftermath of the spinning um, action that happens uh, prior. Another musical example I'd like to play for you is from Chopin's Versus. <laughs> even though it's not a perfect trill, uh, the figures are... 
it's going up like that, but there is a figure that returns to the original note. So when it goes up, it comes back down. And this return to the first note kind of reminds me of a trill. And ultimately, it ends up in the... Ends up with the trill. So in a similar way as the Greek, I feel like this, this little returning phrase um, that brings us all the way up. And then when it comes down, we go into a trilling section. Um, this place really reminds me of those... Um, prism uh, that seems to catch the light or models that you hang outside and the wind makes it spin and we see all different angles as it spins. Uh, the spinning image probably has something to do with um, the fact that I played this piece alongside Aspen Santa Fe Ballet and this really mystical and um, poetic uh, music is set to uh, the choreography where um, you see an aerial view of a number of umbrellas and with this section the umbrellas start to turn and I, I always felt that this this um, trilling of the umbrellas was just perfect um, for this score. Before I go I'd like to talk to you a little bit about a very important aspect of the trill going back to its ornamental role so back to the box French suite number five we have this as it's beginning so we're embellishing um, on the second note this is the first note then this one we trill that's our destination so when we're trilling um, on, let's say, C with its upper neighbor, so C and D, we're going back and forth and oscillating, turning it into a trill. Make sure when you're trilling, um, you accentuate or keep the original note in mind. So, not the upper neighbor could. Um, stick out more than um, you want. In that case, the melody ends up changing. So instead of you start hearing, you see, so it's like the ornament became the main item if you are not careful. So make sure that um, the ornamental um, pitch of the trill is really a little bit underneath um, the, the main notes that you want to hear. So today we explored all different ways that a trill can be. It can be an ornament, it could be something that's shimmery, it could create texture, it could create a drama. It has so many roles. So next time you see one of those squiggly signs on top of certain notes or see the word, word trill on top of certain notes, um, I hope you give all these options a try to figure out exactly which one fits the best. Thank you for listening. See you next time.